okay this is my blue and white friday um beginning of our uh, monetary unit and this is the basics the easy stuff i'll do a couple more over the weekend and release them for you next tuesday i think we're going to have a monetary test basically bank and balance sheet um which remember is going to be most people think it's very tough what i intend to do is just do some intro videos the first couple and then monday i think i'll do one where i go through like five different bank and balance sheet essay questions which should prepare you pretty well all right so here's the title of the lecture and these notes will probably be due tuesday morning all right remember make sure you have the audio on because a lot of this i'm just going to be explaining to you all right there's three roles of money we just did this before spring break number one a medium of exchange it's unlikely they'd ask you a question on this with two essays but they might um the, you know we don't know so medium of exchange means it's got to be something you know portable easy to carry around as i've talked to you before most americans prefer paper money but it seems like most a lot of other countries prefer coins it's a medium of exchange it's got to be a store of value and what you do is you work and you put all your um money into savings uh, and then when you 30 years from now like like right now obviously with the economy and the shape that it's in i'm paying attention to my investments i don't have a lot but i have some and i'm paying attention to them and it's where i put my money away and what you really want to do is put it somewhere where it will grow but at least you want it to be worth what it was when you put it there so money should be a store of value uh, and it should be a unit of account we've talked about that in two different situations but a unit of account my uh, analogy that is speaking money so when someone says they're going to offer you a job paying 13 bucks an hour you know whether or not it's a good deal they offered you 13 shekels you wouldn't know it so that means m that money the the shekel is not sure serving its unit of account uh function for you but it probably is in the country they use it all right moving on the types of money um uh, commodity money gold silver salt it's money that's worth something it can be used it, ha it has a value other than uh, apart from its value as money commodity backed money i only know one example that's when the dollar bills sold you know issued here in the united states were backed in gold or silver uh, and we sh i showed you examples of that in class and finally is what we have now most countries have is fiat money it's only worth what it uh what the government says it is so the u.s government gives you a piece of paper and says hey this is a hundred dollar bill i would imagine that the literal intrinsic value of a hundred dollar bill and a one dollar bill are exactly the same so the fact that the hundred dollar bill is worth more because it has two more zeros is because the government says it is that's fiat money all right now um, this is very important the way the fed measures the money supply now i want you to start labeling this label these notes monetary um policy because this is an open note test and what we think they're going to do is blanket you with a whole bunch of questions and not give you enough time i watched this video the other day about ap macro and the theory is they're going to give you so much time that you don't so many questions that you only have time to go look them all up so you need to know some of this stuff the person who made the video which is somebody pretty knowledgeable also said you can probably leave several questions blank and still get enough right to prove that you know enough about economics that you deserve credit but uh, i want you just to have this stuff on your desk where you can just look it up real real quickly and we're going to talk probably maybe the day of the exam i will probably do some kind of review the day of the exam telling you here's how to be organized okay so there's m1 i hope you remember doing this m1 is three things cash which is currency coins and paper money ca uh, cash checking accounts also called demand deposits and travelers checks those three things and then comes and this is money okay these uh m2 also includes this tricks up a lot of kids and i've shown you how this has been done um this where is my cursor this also includes the three things from m1 cash checking accounts Travelers checks. And so what happens is if you have a hundred dollars in cash and you put it in your second account, M1 has not changed. Savings accounts. Now the last three. So um, let me see how I did this. I, I told the kids when I'm teaching this for a regular year, 
to just, when you get the multiple choice, just write all this down. Just memorize it, write it down. Well, now you're not going to have to do it. You can have it right there in front of you. Cash, checking accounts, traveler's checks, and these three additional things. Savings accounts, time deposits, which some people call certificates of deposit, and money market accounts. I don't think you'll see time deposits or money market accounts on there, but you might. But the deal is you can pay a bill with a check, a check, a traveler's check, or cash. You cannot pay a bill with a savings account. However, you can take your money out of your savings account into cash and pay it or transfer it with your phone, your app, whatever that you have on your phone from your checking account into your, from your savings account into your checking account and then write a check on it. And so these three things here at the bottom are known as near monies, okay? Near monies. Again, they're not likely to ask you direct questions on this, but they uh, might throw you a banking, your banking balance sheet. I think absolute and comparative advantage or banking balance sheet is something they're very likely to give you this year because they're so difficult. They're so commonly used that uh, it, you're not going to be able to go look all this up. So I would think a bank and balance sheet would be very, very likely. Remember Monday, the plan is I'm going to give you a whole, probably four or five of them. And I'll give you the question and I'll tell you to pause the video. Then you go do it on your own. Then I'll show you the answers. Okay. Fed monetary tools, the reserve ratio. And I always call this the nuclear option. And here's what I told you. I'm starting to regret it now. I've told my classes like the last three years, you know, one day when you're 30 or 40 years old, if you're driving down the road and you hear that the government has changed the reserve ratio, just keep driving. Well, I don't know how many of you watched that video that Janet Yellen did the other day, the, the ex-chairman of the Federal Reserve. She said, I Googled this and couldn't find it. But she said, as part of this emergency actions that the government's doing at the Federal Reserve, remember, which is technically separate from the federal government, that the Federal Reserve had reduced the reserve requirement to zero. And so please do not leave and go to another country now. And in the future, I may not have to say that. But I told you that ever since they started this back in the 90s or whenever, or whenever was the last time they changed it, it was 10%. And it had not changed. And it was probably never going to. And that's what happens when I say things like that. Now, according to Janet Yellen, it is zero. So if the government, remember what that is, and this is the whole basis of the bank and balance sheet uh, questions, that is how much of checking accounts banks have to keep on hand. So if you have $100 million, if, there's, if you have a bank and there's $100 million in checking accounts, there better be $10 million on site somewhere or somewhere nearby if the reserve ratio is 10%. Now, if you have an extra $100 million in savings, you have to keep any of that. This is only for demand deposits. And so if the government wants to expand the economy now, I'm not going to put the graphs up, and I'm trying to make this video relatively short. Uh, but what happens is if the government wants to expand the economy, uh, we're in a recession. If the, if the Fed does, not the government, the Fed, what they do is they lower the reserve ratio. That means the banks can loan out more money. Remember, that money multiplies. That's the other multiplier, which we'll be doing uh, Monday. But when that money multiplies, uh, the money supply gets bigger. If you remember the money market graph, as the money supply gets bigger, the uh, there's more money out there. So interest goes down. As interest goes down, house payments and car payments get cheaper and demand goes up. So if they uh, lower the reserve ratio, that's what you see here. That is expansionary monetary policy. If they raise it and tell banks they have to keep more, thereby shrink in the money supply making money less readily available, causing interest rates to go up, that'll slow the economy down. That's the reserve ratio. Again, I call it the nuclear option. Uh, and this stuff will be on the exam. There's the discount rate. Uh, and the discount rate um, is what the bank loans to its, uh, the Fed loans to member banks. Uh, they call it the discount window or the discount rate. And so if a bank calls the Fed and says, hey, we need to borrow you know, $10 million, they're going to loan it to them. But the Fed keeps this interest rate out there, and it's usually slightly higher, half a point or half a percent higher than the uh, federal funds rate, which I forgot to put on this lecture, but I'll tell you. So anyway, if the government, if the Fed lowers the discount rate, uh, they make it cheaper to borrow money, then that expands the money supply. If they raise the discount rate, it's contractionary. And the third thing the Fed can do is the so-called open market operations. 
And uh, this is the buying or selling of T-bills or treasury bills. And we're going to go into a lot more detail in this. But if you buy T-bills, what the Fed does, I'm not going to draw all the three letters on my head. The Fed takes money out of the vault, remember, which is not in the money supply when it's in the vault. They take it and they buy T-bills. They're putting money into the hands of people. And what happens is when they do that, they put it in their banks or they spend it in the people who they give their money to when they spend it, put their money in the banks. But either way, the money supply goes up, driving interest down. So buying T-bills is expansionary. Selling T-bills is contractionary. And even though I didn't do this in lecture, I want you to go ahead and put a squiggly line here. And underneath that, put target federal funds rate. Now, that is what the banks loan out to each other. And the Fed affects that. And some teachers teach it as a fourth tool. I like to put a squiggly line and say this is an option. They do this all the time. But whether or not the Fed can actually do it as opposed to influencing it, you know, is is just a you know a semantic debate right there but uh we're going to put um federal funds rate and expansionary is lower it and contractionary is raise it no i did that backwards expansionary yeah i did it right expansionary is lower it contractionary is raise it okay moving on all right and so at this point this is going to be it for friday i hope you have a good weekend i'm uh, probably going to uh, record a couple more videos over the weekend. And I know a lot of you like to work at your own pace, so I'll probably tell you when I record them. But this will be the first one for Friday. And these will probably be due Tuesday. Remember, someday, somewhere in the near future, I'm going to have to leave town for one, at least one day. And so I may be out of pocket one day. But I thought it was going to be today, but apparently not. 